Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, as Matt said, I've been to, uh, <clears throat> since I've been uh, elected elect office in 2008, I've been to many Penoir sessions, and uh, I know that uh, there's always lots going on in the evenings, some great dinners, some hospitality suites, some receptions, and I know that uh, I always looked at getting up in the morning and I thought, oh, do I want to go to the breakfast? You know, usually the, the B-listers or the keynote speakers, and uh, well that hasn't changed, uh, the, uh, uh, my perspective on it has, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to, to talk about uh, what is certainly a, a very interesting and dramatic and uh, devastating, but also heartwarming uh, part of our province's history now uh, that happened uh, just uh, about four or five months ago. Uh, <clears throat> shortly after the floods in June, I was appointed uh, by Premier Redford as an Associate Minister of Recovery and Reconstruction. There is uh, three of us. I uh, was appointed for the Southwest Region. That includes uh, this particular area here, uh, and all, all the way down uh, to the Crow's Nest Pass and the sort of the southwestern part of the province. Uh, there is an Associate Minister dedicated just for the High River area, which was significantly impacted as well as down to the, the southeast. So I'm going to try to go through this uh, <clears throat> uh, as fast as I can. I've got a lot of information here. I want to just try to set the context for the, the panel discussion that is going to, going to follow. And I know uh, uh, Andre Corbo, who is uh, over there, who is leading our, uh, our task force, the ADM task force of uh, flood, uh, Southern Alberta Flood Recovery, is going to be on that panel. And he certainly will be able to provide a lot of detailed information uh, as well. So I just want to talk briefly about what it actually is that happened uh, during these floods. And uh, so I have a couple of slides here on uh, around why uh, why we had these floods and what it, what it looked like. And you can see in 2005 we had some substantial flooding as well in Alberta, and uh, you know we thought that was bad. Well, you can see uh, according to this graph, in two and a half hours from the start of where the flood, the water started traveling through I River. At a normal, uh, higher than a normal rate, it took two and a half hours to reach the level that we had seen in the 2005 floods. Um, <clears throat> by about eight, eight hours from when the waters began to rise, uh, they rose so high that they blew out all of the instrumentation to measure the flow rates along the uh, Highwood River going into High River. Uh, so we don't even know today exactly how fast that water and how much that water was coming, and, and we're doing work to. Uh, cross-reference a, a bunch of data that we do have available to try to come up with the best estimates. But it can just show you, just shows you exactly how much uh, or how much uh, it was. Same, you know, the same in the uh, Bow River uh, going through Calgary. You know, way above the peak flow, and uh, you know, certainly in, in the context of the Bow River, and if we're pretty close to the uh, one in one hundred. We hadn't seen flooding like that in close to hundred years. Uh, in that city. Obviously the city of Calgary had changed substantially over hundred uh, the last 100 years, so the uh, impact of those floods are, are, were much more devastating on uh, human and physical, uh, human lives, uh, lives and physical infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we do know uh, that it, in the High River case it was well above that 1 in 100 year standard. Again, we just don't know how much. Um, you know, so on June 20th, we had the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, which uh, uh, manages and coordinates all emergency response from the uh, province's standpoint, issued its highest level of response ever uh, from the Provincial Operations Center. Uh, by June 23rd, we had 27 municipalities declare, declare local states of emergency. We had over 1,000, 100,000 residents evacuated. Uh, all across southern Alberta. Uh, compared to uh, for our American friends here today, uh, in Colorado I believe it was about 18,000 uh, residents that uh, were evacuated. So quite a, a substantial more uh, were, were evacuated. Uh, one of the other interesting things is the areas that were impacted cover a 55,000 square kilometer area in this province. So again, very, very widespread. Uh, and then, you know, obviously when you mix that much water running that fast with the, the amount of debris, whether they be rocks, trees, or physical infrastructures that have been taken out, uh, you do have significant threat to human life and we did have four casualties. Uh, here's some pictures that uh, 
that uh, you might find very interesting. Uh, the response to the flood, whether it be from the municipalities, the first responders, or just Albertans in general, was phenomenal. And this is where I say this part is really heartwarming. Um, I, I have never, never, I, I have shivers right now thinking back about the response that we had from Calgarians, from Albertans on this flood. People helping their neighbors, people helping strangers. You just don't get that in many places, and it was phenomenal. Uh, these are some pictures uh, that, uh, that are sort of well known, uh, sort of what happened from all across the province. Two in particular, the one in the bottom right corner uh, was sort of a bit of a, a famous picture. This, this firefighter has got this huge grin on his face carrying this older lady. I, I mean, no one knows what they were exactly talking about, but considering the circumstances, it was quite unique and, and uh, it made uh, a lot of headlines. And the one on the top left was very unique. About two days after the flood started to subside, we were doing a press conference in an area that overlooks the Bow River in Calgary. And, uh, uh, you know, that's our premier there, Premier Redford. And there's a picture of her with, with a family and a little guy who was just walking around up there in a Superman suit. And he had been wearing that Superman suit for 48 hours straight. He didn't take it off. And he was wearing it because he heard that there were a lot of people in trouble that needed help. And uh, it was just uh, amazing, and, and it, it was very reflective of the uh, type of the spirit we experienced uh, in Calgary. Uh, this is an interesting picture. One of my favorite places to travel in, uh, uh, in the world is Venice. Absolutely love it. My wife and I have gone there a few times. And frankly, this is what I think Venice looks like if you took a picture from above, right? And this is what Calgary looked like just after, uh, after the flood. <clears throat> so in the aftermath, we had significant uh, uh, damages uh, to infrastructure, uh, hospitals, schools, roads, houses. Uh, you know, here in uh, the, the, the Rockies and the foothills where we have great recreation and recreation opportunities and parks were all damaged. So I'm not going to go through all of all of the data here, but uh, it, again, very widespread damage uh, right across the southern part of the province. Significant infrastructure, the picture on the bottom right is the road that you would have went through to get from the Calgary Airport out to here, just uh, uh, just east of Canmore, uh, the Trans-Canada Highway, which goes right across this uh, this great country of ours, uh, was, was wiped out. We got this thing up and running, I believe it was within eight days after the floods. Eight days, and this was back open to traffic, make sure that people can get out here to bath and still enjoy the great sceneries and the amenities out, uh, out here as well as uh, into Canmore and in the Bull Valley Corridor as well. Uh, the, the other pictures of Calgary, obviously, uh, you, you probably can't see it very well, but uh, that's uh, the, uh, the light rail transit system uh, where there's a tunnel that the train goes under which was completely full of water. Uh, so, <clears throat> We, you know, and, and I, again, I won't go through the details again. These are some pictures of in some of the, the smaller towns uh, and uh, rural areas that uh, I've been working with. Wol roads wiped out, bridges, this bridge completely gone. Obviously, they built the guardrail much better than they built the bridge. But uh, I'm not an engineer, so I, I really don't question those things. Um, the, uh, the, the cost of this is, is substantial. And uh, you know, I think we've seen uh, you know the preliminary estimates that I've seen so far in Colorado uh, between insurance company and the government is about two billion dollars. Uh, when you combine all of the government uh, uh, rebuilding, all of the insurance coverage that is covered uh, in these floods, it's uh, close to seven billion dollars. Uh, in in the the overall scope of the uh, Canadian economy, uh, that is about the same percentage of GDP as the damage caused by. Uh, or in the cost caused by Hurricane Katrina. It's in that, that, that realm. So it's uh, a substantial event, not just for Alberta, for, but uh, for, this, uh, for this country. Uh, so right after the flood, the Premier uh, came in and uh, asked, uh, uh, put together the, the flood, the Southern Alberta Flood Recovery Task Force. There's a ministerial task force as well as an ADM uh, uh, task force. Uh, Municipal Affairs, which has responsibility for emergency, man the emergency management 
agency and emergency planning is taking the lead, and it involves a number of ministries, health, transportation, the uh, environment, sustainable resource development, tourism, parks and recreation, uh, Treasury Board of Finance, Human Services, and Aboriginal Relations. And uh, the objective of this task force, we meet uh, on a, pretty much on a weekly basis to make timely decisions to coordinate the flood response. And uh, we're really working very closely with our municipalities to make sure that they have the supports that they need to take the lead in making sure that their uh, recovery in their community is uh, uh, done uh, efficiently uh, with respect to the, the money that we're investing of taxpayers, as well as uh, to make sure that we're supporting the particular. And, you know, like I said, it's such a big event, uh, every community has some very, very unique needs. <clears throat> Um, so we've put together a disaster recovery or a flood recovery plan uh, and uh, that plan really has four phases and I'm going to just walk through some of the decisions that we've made in those uh, four phases uh, that are identified uh, there. And uh, you know, because again, the widespread nature of this flood, some communities are further down this than others and so we're working on this. It's, this isn't a, a very linear uh, process. We're working on some of these phases, and uh, you know, simultaneously, uh, as well as you know, in different areas, they're further ahead than, than in other areas. <clears throat> um, so I, I just wanted to talk briefly about uh, uh, the the uh, pardon me the the flood response, and I talked a, a little bit about the impact and, and that sort of thing. There's there's three things that I would specifically want to talk about. Two thousand the two thousand five floods that I mentioned. Uh, our MLA, who's a good friend of Penmar, uh, George Bruneville, uh, uh, was uh, the MLA for the High Highwood area at the time, uh, at the High River area, uh, was asked to commission a report on how do we prevent this from, uh, from the future. What's very important, why I put this in the, 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 the recovery uh, or the response point is, is, as policymakers, one of the things that we need to recognize is that a lot of what happens during a flood or disaster situation is a result of the planning that you do beforehand. And uh, there's always the politics of flood and, and you know, they can certainly buoy or, or uh, depress uh, political fortunes of, of, a, of a politician. But the truth is, is that's actually very, uh, not a very accurate uh, way to look at that person's leadership capabilities. Because it's probably the years and years and years of planning beforehand of their predecessors that actually really either made the response effective uh, and efficient or not. And, uh, um, and so we had this report come on in 2005. There were 18 recommendations. We were in the process or 16 of the recommendations had either been undertaken or completed uh, when the floods hit. And uh, there, uh, as a result of those recommendations, there was about 82 million that had been invested in, in uh, long-term mitigation projects. And I know uh, in going around and talking to some of the leaders in the communities that uh, I've been uh, working with, that, that those investments saved them from uh, significant damage as a result of the floods. Um, we also have uh, an emergency, uh, emergency management plan. Again, this is the stuff that's leading up to an event that happens that is really what drives whether your, your flood response is effective or not. Uh, you know, we all know that uh, when you get in a disaster situation, Adrenaline usually takes over, but it's usually what you did before that that uh, allows uh, <coughs> allows you to be effective in, in those circumstances. And the last thing I just wanted to mention before I move on to the stabilization phase is one of the big challenges is and, you know when it comes to flood, and, and you know we've received a, you know a fair bit of criticism uh, in some of the communities around this is you know how do you warn people early enough? Uh, around these things to get people out of the way to make sure that we're saving the infrastructure. One of the things that's important to, to realize is that you have to, you know it's always a challenge. The the uh, <clears throat> the event that happened on on, on June nineteenth, the the weather prediction for the, the the eastern slopes and the foothills in this province, um, we had the exact same scenario look like it was unfolding about three months later on September fifth. In fact, I think uh, there was a lot of people within the Alberta Emergency Management Agency that were quite worried, but the precipitation didn't re realize itself. Uh, there, uh, it, at least in the concentrated manner that it did the, the night of uh, June, uh, June 19th. And I remember talking with uh, one of our, our uh, people that worked in the Department of Environment and Sustainable Resource Development. He says he sees that scenario, the meteorological scenario, happened about six or seven times a year where 
he would go to bed with that sort of forecast, and it can go either way. And it's a very small, per it's a very unlikely chance that it can go a certain way that causes the amount of rain to happen in a concentrated uh, area like it did uh, on June 19th. He said in the 40 years that he's been working in that department, he says he would have seen that, that forecast, and if he lived along the river, he said he would have comfortably gone to bed that night and not worried. Uh, so it, it's very hard to predict these things and, uh, and, and provide uh, timely information to people. Sometimes it can, by the time we realize what's really happening, uh, it, it, it's hard to uh, get that response. So uh, the, the stabilization phase, one of the interesting things is the town of High River, which was impacted significantly. All of the residents, uh, 10,000 residents were uh, evacuated. Um, <clears throat> significant, significant damage to uh, private property, uh, private infrastructure, public infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> shortly after the flood on June 28th, we had to declare a provincial state of emergency for the first time in the history of this province. And uh, you can see there that the mayor uh, was uh, at a, in a position where he needed uh, stronger support from the province and we were able uh, to do that. And so that existed for about 14 days before we turned it back over. One of the other things, shortly after the flood, we found out to a number of the communities where there had been evacuation orders and uh, issued preloaded de pre debit cards uh, to uh, those that had, uh, uh, the criteria was they lived in an area that was issued a mandatory evacuation order and they were displaced from the home for a period of eight consecutive days as a result of the flood. And uh, they all they had to do was go to one of these centers, sign a statutory declaration saying that they met this criteria and uh, they received a preloaded debit card in the amounts that are shown on the screen there. Uh, you know, obviously the, the big challenge was trying to get that out uh, in a timely manner. Uh, so one of the things, uh, move on uh, to our sort of uh, immediate recovery. Uh, the big thing, and uh, you know what a lot of focus is on, is what we call the disaster recovery program. And uh, I, I think what is very key to the disaster recovery program is, is this is a program that's a cost share program between the province and the federal government, so that we spread the costs over a broader uh, uh, tax base, and it's. Uh, uh, every province has access to it when they meet the, uh, meet the criteria and it's specifically for individuals and uh, what you need to know is that in Canada there's very limited overland flooding cover insurance coverage available and so those that experience overland flooding as a result of this flood uh, would have access to the disaster recovery program which kicks in and covers uninsurable losses where insurance is not readily available or available for that particular uh, disaster. And the, the key to this is that it isn't, it isn't an insurance program. It is a program that returns essential property, so the key is essential property, to its basic function. Again, its basic function. So we're not replacing wine cellars because we don't believe wine cellars are essential properties. Uh, we're also not buying 80-inch TVs for people because we don't believe an 80-inch uh, screen TV uh, provides any sort of level of basic function. There is a, a, a cap on if someone needs to replace a TV, they get $400, which probably these days gets you a nice 42-inch TV. So, uh, um, so that's essentially uh, the, the premises of the program. Um, this is just sort of you know how it, how the program uh, is kicked in. Um, <clears throat> municipalities apply for a disaster recovery on behalf of their residents as a result of disastrous events. The province approves the request and sets up a program based off of the following criteria. Uh, and then residents then work with the, the disaster recovery program, which uh, uh, is run through the Alberta Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and uh, you'll see when we get there, you know, so here's a bit, uh, I won't go through this in, in great detail uh, in time, uh, in respect for time, but uh, <clears throat> that's sort of who's eligible and uh, what kind of support that is, uh, is provided. A big challenge, obviously, we contract out the uh, administration of the, the program and uh, that company had, had to go from 18 employees to about 190 uh, as a result of this flood. Uh, Alberta already has a tight labor, labor market, so I can't imagine that was uh, real, real easy and it provided significant challenges uh, for us in the, in the first couple months. Uh, you know, and, and uh, obviously, like I said, owners are then responsible for getting the information required uh, by the program to make sure that uh, there's the proper checks and balances as far as the proper spending of money, and, and that's always a challenge 
when, when you're in a, a, a situation where your home's been devastated or whatnot, uh, you know, there's obviously huge mental pressures and, uh, you know, people don't always understand exactly what they need to provide. So it uh, takes a while sometimes to work with some of the, the people that uh, are doing that. One of the things that we had to make quick decisions on is rebuilding uh, in what we call our flood hazard areas, which is defined as a floodway and a flood fringe. We had to create policies around that, whether we're going to allow people that live in floodways, which is where water and flood events typically flows faster and at greater volumes, you know, and, and are there going to be any restrictions put on uh, in place? And we've made those decisions. Uh, the two final recommendations in the Gronovel report that we had in implemented actually uh, <clears throat> encompasses this, this particular stuff. So we've uh, created policies around that. And, and again, it, it's a bit of a thing. You're trying to get information out to people as fast as possible so they can make decisions. But you know, you have details in those policies that need to be taken care of and, and be thought through carefully. So it is a bit of an iterative process on some of these things. We did go back and forth a little bit, make a decision, you know, get some feedback, get it up there in the public, get some feedback, tweak it a little bit, and uh, I think we're in a, a very good position. So we are trying to restrict uh, development or encourage uh, uh, people uh, if they have uh, faced with the choice of rebuilding or repairing. Uh, taking a buyout and actually getting out of the floodway at their prop the assessed property value, as well as putting some conditions on the funding that's coming uh, to them if they live in a flood uh, flood fringe, to make sure that we have a more they have a more resilient uh, house uh, in case of the next flood. We have substantial erosion. These are all uh, pictures from areas that are around here in the Canmore Valley area. Uh, this house on the bottom right, it's amazing. That, that, that riverbank was, you know, 60 feet away from, uh, from that house. It's now hanging over a cliff 40 feet over top of the river. Um, and so substantial damage. Uh, this is Cougar Creek, uh, top left, Cougar Creek in Canmore, uh, Bright Creek on the right, and uh, Exshaw there on the, the bottom left. So uh, some very powerful images as to what exactly occurred and the type of damage that we're thinking of. So, the, the, so we had to put in place a flood erosion control program. The disaster recovery program really doesn't contemplate the loss of land. It mostly contemplates the loss of physical infrastructure. So how do we deal with this, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to those that have lost property that their house is sitting on or uh, where property has been eroded or land been eroded and it caused significant that could cause significant public safety issues in the future. So we've come up with a flood erosion control program, working with municipalities through the uh, Environment Sustainable Resource Development. And, and those are some of the aspects that uh, we're looking at. We've had come up with programs for supports for small businesses, a loan guarantee program where we back, where you're working with the financial institutions, back a, uh, a, a loan by uh, up to 25%. Uh, so that uh, the, the banks feel like we're a, a partner with them. Uh, and then we also have uh, an interest rebate program on those loans that will pr provide businesses that are accessing those loans uh, to uh, uh, be able to have the interest paid for them for a period of time while they're recovering, while they're waiting for their disaster recovery claim, or while they're waiting for their insurance, or even if they had insurance or, and had a high deductible so that they're able to uh, pay their deductible in case if, if they're a small business. And, don't have that type of cash sitting around, able to pay that deductible, that get access to their insurance. Um, I, I'm not going to run through all of these uh, in the interest of time. It's kind of where we're at today. Um, you know, 70 million immediate support through the preloaded debit cards. Uh, we've had over tw uh, 92 disaster recovery program applications, uh, 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 about 1,200 uh, for small business supports, uh, 3,800 payments have been issued. Uh, totaling nearly 22.2 uh, million. Um, uh, there's still 1,300 uh, uh, people living in temporary houses. Again, compared to Colorado, I believe there's just 139 living in temporary houses. 92% um, of the roads that have were closed and damaged as a result uh, have been, uh, of the flood have been opened. 200 uh, bridges have now been inspected, all of these sort of sort of things. So if, if we get into the long-term uh, recovery, and, you know, there's significant talk about mitigation. Uh, we want to take three strategies. We're talking about uh, uh, upstream management of water flow of peak, uh, peak water periods. And we've got to make sure that uh, we do so and, 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 and not forget about the fact that in Alberta we also have drought. And uh, so we're trying to manage 
that and what that might look like, some bigger type projects. Uh, and we're also working with communities to look at what they need to put in place right in their community uh, to uh, prevent uh, damage to infrastructure and, and to property. And uh, you know, obviously as we rebuild, we want to rebuild in a more resilient way. And uh, we've taken the opportunity in a number of, cir a number of circumstances to rebuild in a way that we think is better and will uh, resist uh, flooded flooding in the future and be more resilient. Uh, <clears throat> so we had a flood symposium on October 4th where we brought in a number of experts, all a number of the communities that were affected and people that wanted to talk about where we need to do in the future as well as there was a community flood mitigation expert panel that was led by uh, Alan Martin who's uh, quite a well-known uh, and successful guy in Calgary and they brought forward a number of ideas that we're now working through the details uh, on. Um, we've got a bill in the legislature right now called the Flood Recovery and Reconstruction Act that uh, empowers the minister to make some regulations around uh, some of the policies that we made so that we can legally uh, implement them, so to speak. Um, we've invested uh, $8 million over two years in doing flood map updating to identify those floodways and flood fringes. Uh, that's about a quadruple of the resources per year that we have been spending uh, on that particular uh, initiative. And then eventually we will be doing an independent review uh, to learn the lessons uh, that uh, uh, have, will result from this. And there's many lessons. Yeah, in, in these circumstances, we know that you can't do everything perfect. You're making decisions fast. They have to be timely. You're doing so that you can save people's lives, you can save property, and that uh, you can make sure that you're rebuilding communities uh, as fast as you possibly can to get them back to their sort of normal state. And, uh, and when you do things that fast, you're bound to make mistakes. What we're going to do is we're going to do an independent review of those, make sure we learn those lessons, and make sure that uh, the next time that this happens in this province or anywhere else, uh, whether they be the, the jurisdictions here at Penmar or whatnot, that they can take the best practices that we've learned, the mistakes that we've learned, and to make sure that, uh, that the response to any sort of disaster anywhere in North America or the world uh, can use those. 